Well, hey there, Reconciled Church. Pastor Kevin here, back with another installment in our study of the Trinity. So if you've been with us for the past uh, two weeks, you know we're kind of doing a deep dive on a doctrine, and specifically the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, it's one of those things that is, I know, uh, confusing for some, and uh, some people believe that they have a handle on it, maybe don't. And so what I want to do is take a good long time uh, just studying one topic with you guys, and so that we all are understand what is meant by this and what is the scriptural basis for this doctrine. Okay? So before we get into a couple, uh, just a little bit of catch up here. Uh, first week, we did a brief overview of what the doctrine of the Trinity is. Um, if you were with us, we understand that, uh, in short, Trinitarians hold that the Bible teaches that there is one God who has eternally existed in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, in week two, we uh, looked at what does the, t the Scripture teach about the Son. Jesus Christ, uh, what we find, he is fully God. He's not some kind of lesser God. He's not, God, he's not like uh, the under God or something like that, but rather he's actually God Almighty. So this week what I want to do is look at the idea of the Holy Spirit. Um, once again, this is one of those topics that people just get really confused on a lot, and so uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding what we mean by the Holy Spirit. So some people, uh, what a lot of people I think b believe when they talk about the Holy Spirit is basically like the force in Star, Star Wars. It's an impersonal thing that kind of does stuff, uh, but it's not necessarily viewed as actually being like a personal being. Um, and so to put it another way, to some people, the spirit is an it rather than a he. What I want to show you is that two things today, that the Holy Spirit is definitely a personal being, that he is a he, and that he is also God Almighty as well. So that's the task we have before us. Let's get into the text. All right, so the first, uh, first text I have for you this morning, Micah 2, 7. Is it being said, house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord impatient? Are these his works? Do my words not do good for the one who uh, for the one walking rightly? Okay, so what do we learn about the spirit of the Lord from this passage? Well, first, he's patient, or rather, as Micah puts it, he doesn't grow impatient. Um, the, so at this point, this already lets us know we're not talking about a force like the wind or something. Some of the confusion comes from uh, words like ruah, where we get our word for spirit uh, from, can also refer to the wind. Uh, but the wind doesn't grow impatient. Uh, the wind does isn't patient either. It doesn't do any of those things. Those are things persons do, people do. Micah uses the, also the personal pronoun here, his. It says, is the spirit of the Lord impatient? Are these his works? So, all signs so far point to the fact that the spirit of the Lord is a person, not a thing. Give you another one, Nehemiah 9.30. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hand of the peoples of the lands. So how did God testify through the prophets? By his spirit. Giving testimony, by the way, is something people do. When, we see, when they see a crime, they testify about what they saw. And so giving testimony is something else that a person does. The New Testament, now that's Old Testament passages. What about the New Testament? Uh, is there any New Testament evidence that the Holy Spirit actually is a person rather than a thing? Well, let's look at it. 2 Corinthians 13, 14, this is what I got for you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So this is, uh, this is a, uh, a benediction, and it's a beautiful Trinitarian benediction, by the way, here. But what is attributed to the Holy Spirit in this benediction? Fellowship. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Now, fellowship, what's fellowship? Fellowship's an intimate relationship, which requires people. So you may love your car, but you don't have fellowship with your car. People have fellowship. 
So in order to have fellowship, you have to have at least two people. So if the Holy Spirit has fellowship, therefore he is a person. Uh, let me give you another example. In Acts chapter 5, Peter chastises Ananias and, Sapphi and Sapphira uh, for uh, basically, if you know the story, they sold a plot of land, they pretended they gave it all, and, in tr and what ends up happening is they kept some of the money and God ends up striking them down for it. So here's Acts 5.3. But Peter said, Ananias, or Ananias, I said it before, which is probably wrong. Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? So what, is, what did Ananias do here? He lied. He lied to the Holy Spirit. Lying implies an attempt, at least, of deception. You can't deceive the wind. You can't lie to gravity. Those are impersonal forces, okay? L to lie to someone implies that they have consciousness. It assumes that they are a someone and not a something. So throughout the Bible, we're told that the spirit can be angered, that the spirit can be grieved, that he can be joyed. Uh, he teaches, he comforts, he convicts. These are all things that you would not use to, ex to describe an impersonal force. So clearly, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is a person. So, it's one thing to know that the Spirit is a person. How do we know that he's God? Well, let's do the same thing. Let's go to start in the Old Testament. Let's go to the New. Having shown the Spirit is a person, now we ask the question if the Bible teaches he's God. Here's the first passage, Psalm 51.11. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So, verse 11 is a form of parallelism, which if you were with us when we studied things like the Psalms and Proverbs and things like that, you know this is really prominent in Hebrew writing. What it is is basically you have two lines that are explaining the same thing, but they give uh, greater understanding to the concept by explaining it two ways. So, in this sense, here the psalmist, who's David, pleads with the Lord not to cast him away from his presence. How would God do that? Well, by removing his Holy Spirit from David. So, the Holy Spirit is equated with the presence of God here, the presence of the Lord. Um, now, this idea is... The, the pres that the presence of the Holy Spirit is taken as the presence of God, but also distinct, can be hard to understand if you are not, but, but it's easy to understand if you're a Trinitarian, because we go, yeah, no, absolutely. To take, a, since the Spirit is God, if you remove the Spirit from someone, you're removing God from their presence, but also the one who is removing it is distinct from the, that which is being removed. So we have both, uh, we have both, Unity and distinction here. Let's look at another passage, Job. Job 33, 4. Job declares, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So, Job credits the Spirit of God with his creation. Now, as you may recall from Genesis, Adam and Eve, or specifically, sorry, not Adam and Eve, just Adam, was formed from the dust of the earth, and it was the breath of God which made him alive. Job credits that work to the Holy Spirit. Let me give you another passage. Psalm 104, verse 30. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. So the spirit is viewed as an active agent, again in creation. But, but not only this, we have to ask the question, who is the you the psalmist speaks of? He says, when you send forth your spirit... Who is the you here? Well, verse 28 tells us. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. So what's the Hebrew word which is, transla which, uh, is translated into English as Lord in verse 28? Well, it's the word we talked about last week, the, the tetragrammaton. Basically, it's the word Yahweh or Jehovah. Um, I bring this out specifically because I know there's at least one Jehovah's Witness uh, listening to these studies, so I want to just make this clear. The spirit in Psalm 104 is Yahweh, Jehovah, not an impersonal force. All right, let's go to some New Testament in, uh, info as well. 
Acts 28. Paul's on trial in Rome, and he ends his, his uh, speech by saying this, verse 25. And disagreeing among themselves, they departed after Paul and had made one statement. The Holy Spirit was right in, your saying, in saying to your fathers through Isaiah the prophet, Go to this people and say, You will indeed hear but never understand. You will indeed see but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull. And with their ears they can barely hear, and with their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will listen. Okay, why do I bring up this passage? Well, it's of special significance. Because here, in reference to what the Holy Spirit said, it references Isaiah chapter 6. So, who does Paul attribute the words of Isaiah 6 to? The Holy Spirit. But who does Isaiah say spoke? Well, Isaiah 6, 8 says, I heard the voice of the Lord. Isaiah says it was the voice of the Lord. Now, if you remember from last week, I actually showed that the Apostle John said of Isaiah 6 that Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus. However, in Isaiah's own account, he says that he saw the Lord. Um, Isaiah 6, 5, And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Specifically, Israel says that, it, or Isaiah says that he saw Jehovah Saba, the Lord of armies. So, this is really interesting. What we now have is a revelation of God to which the, apostle, the apostles attributed to two persons of the Trinity. The Son, whose glory is seen, and the Spirit, whose voice speaks. Guys, I hope this has been helpful for you guys uh, to see this. Uh, as we have demonstrated, the Bible in both the Old and New Testaments declares that the Holy Spirit is none other than God Almighty himself. Not only that... But we have even shown that the singular work of Yahweh in the Old Testament is then understood as the work of multiple members of the Trinity working in unity, albeit assuming distinct roles in the New Testament. And we'll talk more about the inner re, the relationship of the persons of the Trinity in weeks ahead. But guys, I hope this has been helpful. Uh, a little bit of a quicker one for you today. God bless. I'll see you next week.